Hello, Laverne here, and I'd like to thank you for joining me. May this video be a blessing to you and to your loved ones, and may it honor and may it glorify our Father and Creator in heaven. How many of you watching this video have been water baptized? How many of you have not actually been water baptized, but you've said some sort of sinner's prayer, maybe a pastor or an elder or just someone on the street led you in a sinner's prayer and then told you that from this point on, you are now saved, that you can never lose your salvation. How many of you have had someone come to your home and uh, taught you the gospel, and then after talking to you about the gospel, led you in some form of sinner's prayer? How many of you have watched videos on YouTube where at some point in the video, they will say something like, if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, follow me in this prayer. And the idea is that after saying this prayer and you invite Christ into your heart, you are now saved. How many of you have joined a church or you've been in a church and they've had an altar call? An altar call, perhaps at the end of a service, when they ask people to come down <clears throat> and then they are led in a sinner's prayer by a pastor or one of the elders of the church. And then you are led to believe that now you are saved. Now you've done everything you need to do to be saved, and there's nothing more you can do, nothing more you even need to try to do, that from that point on, you can never lose your salvation. You can never out -sin God's grace. It doesn't matter what you do. You are now guaranteed a spot in heaven. Well, I'd like to share with you evidence that this is a lie of the devil. The devil is the one that created these altar calls. The devil is the one behind the creation of the sinner's prayer and even behind some of what is done for water baptism. I've explained in a good number of my videos that the devil has worked very hard to eliminate as much of God's written word as what he can. Now, you will have many Christians claim that the Bible contains absolutely everything you need to know for salvation, that there is nothing else, nothing outside of the Bible that is needed. Well, I would like to ask you a simple question. What's the proper way for water baptism? And when should it be done? How should it be done? What is the uh you know this idea of an altar call can you find that in the bible what must we actually do to be saved and when somebody comes to christ what are we supposed to do how are we to invite them into the church what must they know beforehand well the bible is not clear on this matter in fact the bible is pretty vague on the matter of water baptism and on how we are saved and what we must do. But we find in many non canonical writings exactly how water baptism is supposed to be done. And when you read these writings, what you see is that how the altar call is performed and practiced today in many churches is simply not scriptural. So I'd like to look at a writing known as the Didache. This writing is also known as the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, and it is a second century writing. Now, a lot of Christians will say then, well, then we can't accept it. It's second century. That's when it was first written. Therefore, it doesn't fit with the canonical writings. If it's going to be a canonical writing, it must have been written in the first century. It must have been written by the apostles who actually walked with Christ. But consider the Gospels themselves. The Gospels were not put to pen and paper until 25 to 30 to 40 years after the death of Christ. Christ had nothing to do with actually putting to pen and paper the Gospels. So it was long after the death of Christ that the apostles finally put some of the things down so that we would have them. Well, the same is true of the apostles. If you accept that 
the teachings of Christ are still valid, even though he had nothing to do with their writing, and even though they were not written until 30 to 40 years after his death and resurrection, then surely it follows you would accept something similar when it comes to the apostles. The apostles taught their followers, and then their follow, and then those followers eventually put to pen and paper what the apostles taught. So the Didache is a legitimate writing. We are to believe this is what the early fathers believed, is that the apostles are the ones that gave these instructions found in the Didache. Now, the first six chapters are spent describing two paths. One is a path of righteousness that leads to life, and the other is a path that leads to destruction, and it's one of unrighteousness. Then what's important is that at the end of it, this writing then goes into water baptism and how someone is to be baptized, what they must do. And at the very beginning, what we are told, recite these things. And by uh, it says after reciting these things, it is therefore talking about those first six chapters. So when somebody is water baptized, they are supposed to recite the first six chapters of this writing. They are supposed to have a full understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And then we find verification and validation of this in another writing known as the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Clementine's homilies. We find in the homilies that Peter refuses to allow a woman to see two sons of hers that she thought had died at sea years previously. So her two sons were believers. They were with this group that were traveling the country with Peter. And then these two sons, their mother finds this group. But she is told by Peter that she could not share a meal with her sons until she had been water baptized. But before she could be water baptized, she had to first fast for a period of time. She could not just say, okay, yeah, fine, water baptize me. No, she had to wait. She had to fast. So Peter was very strict as to the rules regarding baptism. Now, getting back to the Didache, it tells us as well that the person being baptized and the person doing the baptism must fast prior to the baptism. So this idea that you can be in a church and uh, the pastor says, okay, who wants to be water baptized? Come on down. And then they say something similar to a sinner's prayer. And then that's it. That is not scriptural. When somebody becomes water baptized, before they are water baptized, both the person baptizing and the one doing the baptizing must fast prior to this. And the person being baptized must have a full understanding of what is expected of the believer. This is why we have the six chapters uh, leading up to the instructions for baptism in the Didache, explaining what is expected of a believer, what they must not do, and what they must do. Christ himself taught something similar when he said, it's important that somebody count the cost if they want to be a follower of mine. And this is what the early Christians did. They ensured that anyone who was going to become a member of the church, that they knew what the cost was going to be. And unlike what many Christians teach today, the cost is great. It is, it is not simply saying a sinner's prayer. It is not saying, yep, you want to invite Christ into your heart, and that's it. That's all there is to it. No, there is a, a very severe cost. The, the, the cost of being a follower of Christ is great, but that's not taught today. We find... This also validated in another writing known as the Gospel according to Thomas, not to be confused with the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel according to Thomas is 
a book that is made up of the sayings of Christ, the sayings and the parables of our Messiah. And what we see at the very beginning of this book is that Christ tells us that when somebody is searching for the truth, they are first going to be troubled. But again, that's not what is taught in the church today. You will be troubled. Anybody who is taught the true gospel of Christ will at first be troubled. Then they will be amazed, and then they will rule over the all. So the true gospel of Christ, if it's taught properly, is going to trouble people. They will understand that to be a follower of Christ is going to cost them. It may cost them money finances, and may cost them their job, and may cost them their marriage, and may cause division in their family. Their parents may want to have nothing more to do with them. The cost is great if you want to be a follower of Christ. The things that you must give up, that you enjoy, giving up the things of this world. But these things are not taught in the church today. So the Didache shows without question that the altar call today as its practice, the sinner's prayer, and even water baptism as its practice today in most churches is not scriptural. Then consider how you're supposed to be baptized once you make that decision and you are allowed to be baptized by the elders of the church once they accept you and believe that you are ready to be a follower of Christ. We are told that we are to be baptized in running water. And if that's not possible, it goes on down the list. Uh, so there are methods that you can be water baptized if there's no running water, you know, no river, and so on. But what's important is we are told to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are not simply supposed to be baptized in the name of the Son. But many people today, many churches, th this is how they do it. They simply baptize in the name of the Son. But that is unscriptural. So you see, it is important to have more than the Bible. The Bible does not explain many things that, that we actually need to know. The Bible in no way whatsoever can be said to include all of God's written word. And actually, I want to point out one more thing about the Didache that is very important. This is the last line that we see before the Didache gets into uh, water baptism. It specifically states, do not, under any circumstances, eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, this is, in fact, something that we do see in the Bible being taught, being commanded. We find it in the book of Acts, where a letter is written to those believers in Antioch, stressing the importance of not eating food sacrificed to idols. We find it in the book of Revelation, where Christ condemns a church for eating food sacrificed to idols, tells them they must not do this. We also find in Clementine's homilies, as I already talked about, we find in this writing that Peter explains we must not eat food sacrificed to idols because when we do, we are sitting down and feasting with demons. But what do you read in the writings of Paul? Paul says it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols. Well, that is a lie. It's not acceptable. Not for any reason is it acceptable to knowingly eat food sacrificed to idols. So you see, the Bible is not enough. If all you had was the Bible, you might just go to this passage by Paul and say, okay, I can eat food sacrificed to idols, no big deal. But when you have more of God's written word, when you have the instructions of the apostles in this letter known as the Didache, you know without question you are not to eat food sacrificed to idols. When you read Clementine's homilies, it makes it abundantly clear the evils of eating food sacrificed to idols. So you see, writings such as the Didache were given to us for a reason. And there's so much more in this writing. 
I've talked about this in a, a previous video, and I'll include a, uh, you know, at the end of this video, a link to uh, a video in which I talk about the Didache as well. My brothers and sisters, let's get this message out there. Easy believism of any kind, this idea of the sinner's prayer, it's evil, it's wicked. If you hear somebody, you know, inviting people to say a sinner's prayer in their YouTube video, explain to them how wrong they are and how evil it is of a practice. All forms of easy believism is a lie of the devil. All right, as always, I look forward to your comments and messages. Were you at one time deceived into saying a sinner's prayer and then came to the understanding that you were saved from that point onward? And since then, you have come out of that apostate church. What about the way in which you were water baptized? Were you baptized in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or just in the name of Christ, of the Son? How many of you uh, had it explained to you what the cost would be if you were to enter the church and become a follower of Christ? Was any of these things, were any of these things ever explained to you? Was the true cost of being a follower of Christ ever explained to you when you first became born again. Till next time, peace and blessings.